Hello everyone, it's me again, your boy Matmus. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. We are talking about tracked vehicles today once again, however this tracked vehicle is rather unique in the fact that it is basically a tracked vehicle like a boat. Yes, we are talking about amphibious fighting vehicles today and particularly the AAVP-7A1 and the variants of it from the United States Marine Corps and around the world. Now, this vehicle you may have seen in many different conflicts around the world and other militaries using it around the world, and it's one of those ones that kind of, once again, gets kind of pushed to the sideline. It doesn't have a 120mm cannon boring out the front of it. It doesn't have rockets on the back. It's not, you know, something you see very much primarily in movies or, you know, video games because it's basically a troop transport, a very glorified boat with tracks. However, I feel it deserves its time and its glory in the world of military vehicles and how I do reviews on vehicles because, you know, troop transports are just as important as anything else that's in a combat role and it's nice to talk about something that is unique, that can be, you know, launched from a ship. That's, that's pretty neat and the fact that this thing is so freaking big and can carry so many troops and still floats is beyond me, but I guess, uh, you know, the people who have designed it clearly know what they're doing because it's doing very well in what it does. So let's get straight into it. So the vehicle was designed to assault any shoreline from basically the well decks of most Navy assault ships. AAVs are highly mobile, tracked, armoured amphibious vehicles that transport marines and cargo to and through hostile territory. The AAVP-7A1 is an armoured assault amphibious fully tracked landing vehicle. The vehicle carries troops in water operations from ship to shore, through rough water and surf zones. It also carries troops to inland objectives after being landed on shore. The vehicle was originally manufactured in the early 1970s to enhance the United States Marine Corps' amphibious capabilities. Over the years, it has gone through numerous upgrades. Many allies have realized the capability that the AAV brings to the military, and have acquired it through foreign military sales. The United States Marine Corps has a total of 1,321 of these vehicles in its inventory as known right now, which is huge, but if you think about it, the Marine Corps itself being its own branch requires a huge influx of APCs or troop transports to get them from the fleet to the shoreline. And of course, the Marines' primary goal when it comes to amphibious assaults is shock and awe and getting on the beachhead quickly, setting up a defensive position and allowing further troops to move in. In March 1964, the United States Marine Corps issued a requirement for a new LVT or landing vehicle tract to replace the LVT-5, used in the 1950s and 1960s as the Model 5 variant. And, after evaluating a number of proposals, a contract for development of a new LVT was awarded to the then Ordnance Division of the FMC Corporation. In January 1994, FMC's Defense Systems Group and BMY's Combat Systems Division formed a new joint venture company called United Defense Limited Partnership. In the 1980s, the Navy and the Marine Corps developed a concept called Over the Horizon Assaulting. This is to avoid enemy strengths, exploit enemy weaknesses, and protect the Navy ships from increased land-based missile threats and sea-based mine threats. The AAV, together with the MV-22 Osprey tilt rotor aircraft, and also the Landing Craft Air Cushion, or LCAC, provides the tactical mobility required to spearhead beachheads. The Marine Corps believed that these were three of the warfighting systems critical to the fleet's ability to take part in land engagements. The AAV allows for immediate, high-speed surface maneuver of Marine infantry units as they emerge from the ships located over the visual horizon of roughly 25 miles maximum. Operations are conducted in a manner that protects the Marine and Naval forces and exploits the intervening sea and land terrain to achieve surprise and pretty much rapidly penetrate the weak points of the enemy's defences to seize those operational objectives on the shoreline or any kind of battle space that requires a amphibious landing. The first production vehicles, which were designated the LVTP-7 or Landing Vehicle Tracked Personnel Model 7, were handed over to the United States Marine Corps on August 1971 and the first unit equipped occurred in March 1972. Final deliveries were made in September 1974, after which the LVTP-5 and its variants were phased out of service. In 1985, the US Marine Corps changed the designation of the LVTP-7A1 to the Amphibious Assault Vehicle Personnel Model 7 Version A1, or the AAVP-7A1, quite the tongue twister for a vehicle. Without changing the full configuration of the vehicle, the name was just modified. 
All new production vehicles were built to the AAV-7A1 configuration, and all existing US-21 Marine vehicles that were not A1 versions were upgraded to the new production standard. The AAV-7A1 and several versions of the LVT have been sold to many countries. In 1972, the Italian Marine Corps purchased 25 LVT-7s via the Military Assistance Program. In April 1995, through the Marine Corps Systems Command, United Defence received a firm fixed price contract for a total of 14 AAV-7A1s for the Brazilian Marines under the Foreign Military Sales Program. Also, in late 1995, United Defence and Samsung Aerospace of South Korea signed a major direct sales contract with the Republic of Korea to produce a total of 57 AAV-7A1 vehicles in three versions between 1996 and the year of 2001. And in September 1997, United Defence entered into a $40 million direct sales contract with Spain to rebuild AAV-7 vehicles to the Spanish Marines that had been originally purchased between 1972 and 1974. These vehicles were upgraded to the AAV-7A1 standard. There are three variants of this vehicle, the P, the C and the R. The personnel variant, the AAV-7PA1, is a troop carrier and can carry 17 to 21 fully combat equipped troops. The command variant, the AAV-CA1, carries an extensive communications capability and other optics. The recovery variant, or AAVR7A1, enables vehicle recovery and maintenance functions and has a completely different maintenance and shot capability to the rest of the vehicles in terms of layout. The more modernised AAV-7A1 had a new advanced engine, transmission and weapon system installed and were added for the overall maintainability of the vehicle to be improved. Interestingly enough, the AAV-7A1 Reliability, Availability and Maintainability Rebuild Structure Program replaced the engine and suspension with the M2 Bradley Fighting Vehicle components modified for the AAV. The RAM RS program commenced in 1999 and was concluded in 2007. This allowed for the vehicles to basically be an uprated M2 Bradley that could float on water. It was planned that the AAV 7A1 vehicle would be replaced by a next generation amphibious combat vehicle. It was to be called the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle and was designed as a replacement. However, it was not adopted by the US Marine Corps due to funding problems and the aging AAV 7s are still used to this day. It is planned that the refurbishment and upgrade to these vehicles will remain operational until 2035. To this day, they are still looking for a more modernised and efficient platform to upgrade and change from the vehicles that are being used today. The AAV-7 has a crew of three, including commander, gunner and driver. The troop carrier has a lot of space and the compartment can hold up to 25 marines and depending on the role that the troops are actually holding at the time, they can carry up to 30 if they are compacted inside. One thing a lot of people don't realise when it comes to amphibious assaults is logistics is extremely important. There is no ability to pull in a truck or pull in a boat to the shore to get supplies. You need things that can be automatically unloaded from the assault crew or the assault craft that is on the beachhead at the time. Interestingly enough, the supplies that the AAV can carry is extraordinary. 4,500 kilograms of supplies can be placed into the back of these vehicles, allowing for ammunition, food, water or other supplies to be drawn onto the beachhead once they have landed. When troops or marines are seated in the back of these vehicles, they are sat on benches. Unfortunately, this is one of the key problems for the AAV, is it is extremely vulnerable to ID or mine blast attacks. Be aware that this vehicle is designed to be primarily a floating boat with tracks and therefore it was reducing its capability to shape the hull in a way that is designed to prevent blasts hitting the troops. The benches themselves that are hoisted onto the side of the vehicle chassis are very vulnerable to damage of the crew or damage of the infantry being carried in the back if they do hit one of these blasts. A lot of different variants and modified structures have been placed into the back of the vehicle during its time to try and improve of this weakness. Entry and exit via a large rear door mounted ramp are on the back of the vehicle including of roof hatches on the top known as mortar hatches. This allows the troops to point out the back if they need to but also a very quick disembark from the rear of the vehicle. This is key when on an amphibious assault because the last thing you want is a slow door coming down as the front of your vehicle is being peppered by coastal or beach defences. 
The rear door is actually one of the biggest key features of this vehicle. Not only does it allow infantry to disembark and embark very quickly, it also allows for supplies and casualties to be brought on and off the vehicle very quickly. When it comes to a beach or amphibious assault, the key is getting onto the beach and off the beach as quickly as possible. Whether it be push forward to engage or pull back to get more supplies, speed is of the essence. Beaches are not a good place to put vehicles on, even if they're attracted. Sand is not good for vehicles when traveling in large amounts of force because sand eventually starts plowing into little ruts and it's more difficult to travel in. Vehicles don't want to sit around waiting for troops to disembark or for supplies to be moved off and the ramp allows for them to do this very efficiently. This allows them to pull out of the sandy rough terrain and pull back into the ocean to get more supplies or push forward and engage with the small arms and weaponry that they have on board of the vehicle. The vehicle is a launched at sea amphibious assault vehicle, which means at the ship of the assaulting fleet, it can be pushed out at a moment's notice and very, very quickly. The vehicle has a welded aluminum or aluminium armor hull. The aluminium hull had a far greater rigidity than steel. It also allowed to reduce the number of reinforcing structures and create far more useful interiors. The armor of the AAV-7 provides protection against small arms fire and artillery shell splinters but was not designed to take direct anti-tank weapon hits like the RPGs. This worried many marine commanders using the vehicles in high threat areas like Iraq. A kit was devised to permit extra add-on armor to be installed on most US Marine Corps vehicles which we see today. What you tend to see on most of the modern US Marine Corps vehicles today is a sort of triangular slash box type reactive explosive armor on the sides of the vehicle. Unfortunately, this affected the buoyancy of the vehicle and its performance through the ocean. Although adding armor wasn't a huge detriment to its speed, it did affect the way it performed in taking on waves and actually traversing through the ocean to hit the beachhead. The same thing applied once it was on the beachhead itself. The added weight of this extra armor put a huge strain on the engine and transmission, with the addition of 25 upped infantry in the back, ammunition to the guns that it carried on top, it was a very, very large amount and a lot to ask for this vehicle. Considering it was not designed to have this huge armor package on the side, it still serves and does pretty good today with its current state. Unfortunately though, even with this upgrade package, recent military conflicts reveal that the AAV-7 is very vulnerable to landmines and improvised explosive devices. The AAV-7 does have a small turret and was originally armed with a 12.7mm heavy machine gun. Later it appeared that the single machine gun just was not efficient enough to actually engage on beachheads and a 40mm automatic grenade launcher was added on the improved AAV-7A1 model. Heavier turrets with a 20mm or 30mm cannon were tested on the amphibious vehicle, however eventually they were just not adopted. The engine of the AAV-7A1 is mounted at the front and is very effective at propelling this very heavy vehicle. Originally this vehicle was powered by a Detroit Diesel 8V-53T turbocharged diesel engine performing at about 400 horsepower. It was a multi-fuel engine which could run on any grade of petrol, diesel, aviation fuel or kerosene. For water propulsion it was provided with two very powerful water jet units at the rear, or alternatively by spinning the tracks themselves. The vehicle has a seaworthiness level of up to sea state 3. Late production models of the AAV-7A1 and most earlier models were later brought up to this standard in the late 1970s. The AAV-7A1 improvements included a new Cummings diesel engine power pack, night vision devices and a new weapon station control system which allowed the crew to fire from inside the vehicle itself and not having to pull into the turret or get on top. There was also improved ventilation and many other detailed changes for the interior. In terms of feedback for the vehicle, the United States Marine Corps has had very positive feedback from its Marines and commanders using it on the battlefield. For the most part, other militaries around the world that utilize this vehicle agree and perform very, very well in the requirements that it's been placed in. I myself think this vehicle is outstanding for what it can do, being able to pull pretty much almost a platoon of troops onto the battlefield very quickly over rough seas and still have the capability to fight on the beachhead is imperative when you're talking about amphibious assault. Another key attribute of this vehicle is the ability for it to be turned around very quickly once back onto the assault ship. The way the assault ship works, which maybe we'll do a video on in the future, allows these vehicles to drive on, turn around, be refueled, rearmed, retrooped up and sent back out again very quickly. It's a shame, like many other vehicles around the world, that it's been put into an environment such as IEDs and RPGs and been expected to perform beyond its limits. 
Remember that the vehicle was never designed to be trampling through the middle of cities with infantry in the back looking out for RPGs and IEDs. Unfortunately, like many vehicles we see, it's been pushed beyond its normal means and been given roles and tasks that it really shouldn't be. Up armoring a vehicle normally isn't such a big deal, but when you're looking at something that's designed to be amphibious and floating in the middle of the ocean, you'd expect that the design is focused purely for an amphibious assault or beach attacks. As you can see though, there are vehicles that have been used in operation environments that are nothing to do with amphibious assaults, and they've been used to actually control ground, take ground and deliver troops in environments that really it was just not designed for. Overall, this ship based vehicle is very very good at what it does, getting troops from the ship to the land effectively, safely and with some firepower once they get there. I can safely say seeing a 40mm and a 50 caliber machine gun punching rounds down range while 25 marines punch out the back of the vehicle would be a pretty terrifying thing to see if I was on a beachhead. Multiply that by 25 other than these vehicles, I would really not want to be on that beachhead. Let me know what you guys think of this vehicle in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you do want to see more, I strongly ask that you please hit that little bell button by the subscribe button and click all to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future. I appreciate you all being here today and if you do wish to contribute any donations or support to my channel, please check out my Patreon page. All the links for everything that I have related to my community or channel are in the description box below, including my merchandise store, my crowdfund for a APC, <laughs> and my Facebook etc is all there. Also if you want to come hang out and chat or play some video games, come hang out on my Discord channel. All the links are there and I hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful day everyone, all the best and bye bye.